Um, well, in the second half of the 16th century, Gonville and Keyes College in Cambridge was settling into a new identity. It was originally founded as Gonville Hall in 1348, the year of the Black Death. And in 1557, it had been refounded by a former student, John Keyes, as Gonville and Keyes College. As the re-founder and subsequently master of the college, Keyes set about reorganizing and rebuilding it in a Renaissance style. And in the half century following the refoundation, four impressive Elizabethan and Jacobean monuments were set up in the chapel. These are testament to attempts to consolidate the college's new corporate identity. They commemorate masters, fellows, and a fellow commoner of the college. And they're unusual for several reasons, particularly their formats. And as you'll see, there are two full-size kneeling effigies, which um, are extremely rare on monuments to schoolmen. But in other respects, these monuments are quite typical of academic communal commemoration, and we'll be exploring those aspects as well. So in what follows, I'll be giving a brief account of the history of the college, putting the chapel and its monuments into context. And then I'll discuss each of the monuments in chronological order. The monument to John Keyes, which was erected sometime between 1573 to 75, a monument to William Webb of 1613, that to Stephen Peirce of 1615, and one to Thomas Legg in 1619. I'll note these main features and the employment of various visual and material and textual strategies, and um, it'll be my argument that these strategies can be broadly construed as rhetorical, um, rhetoric being the art of eloquence, which was extremely important in the curriculum in Cambridge at this period, um, and in fact the grammar school curriculum as well. So the monuments are part of efforts to persuade members of the college to honor their predecessors and follow their virtuous example. The college known as Gonville Hall was founded, as I said, in 1348, the year of the Black Death, by Edmund Gonville, who was rector of Terrington St. Clement in Norfolk. And it was originally, uh, and still is, dedicated to the Annunciation of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Gonville died in 15, uh, sorry, 1351, but William Bateman, Bishop of Norwich and the founder of nearby Trinity Hall, took over his friend's work. And the college slowly grew to fill four sides of the present site's northwest corner in central Cambridge, um, the area of the college now known as Gonville Court. And that's here um, in the sort of, sort of top left of this image. It remained a fairly modest college until about 1570, sorry, 1557, when, as I had said, former student John Keyes set out to refound the college. And um, he was a bit sneaky about this. He initially approached the master and fellows in disguise, saying that he knew of someone who uh, had a lot of money and would be very happy to endow the college um, with that money if they agreed to rename it after him. And after some discussion, they accepted these terms. And at that point, Keyes revealed that it was actually him all along. And the College of Gonville and Keyes came into being. Within a year of the refoundation, the then master, Thomas Beckham, died. And with great reluctance, because he was quite a popular physician in London and very busy, Keyes took over. And he led the college until his death in 1573. He added Keyes Court to the south and he instituted an allegorical scheme of gates throughout the buildings, on which more shortly. Another of Keyes' important legacies was to institute the keeping of the college annals, and these were diligently maintained by Keyes and his successor Thomas Legg until 1603, after which they fell into abeyance for about 50 years, and the annals are basically a record of um, what the college decided to do and what the fellows voted for. They were brought up to date retrospectively in 1655, through the use of original documents, but there are some points of confusion. And these annals were published at the turn of the 20th century by John Venn, who's famous for his Venn diagrams, um, but he was also a fellow of the college and a prolific amateur historian. And he also invented um, a bowling machine that bowled the Australian cricket team out twice. Um, so he was multi-talented. So uh, the annals, which I was, uh, which Venn published, um, are quite an important source for this period. In the later years of the 16th century, the college was settling into its new institutional identity, and this is reflected in the proliferation of monuments in the chapel. 
Members of the college and other benefactors had been buried in the chapel prior to the 16th century, but the surviving early monuments are mainly slabs and brasses. The Elizabethan and Jacobean monuments are significantly more imposing in size, position and format, and I argue linked by an interest in rhetorical play and persuasion. At the time when these monuments were erected, the chapel was more or less unchanged since the 14th century. But since then, it's been expanded, uh, particularly to the east, and the monuments have been moved around. The most impressive monument is that to John Keyes himself. This is a sarcophagus with a classical superstructure completed around 1573 to 75. It was originally on the floor of the chapel under the Roma Romana's window over Keyes' tomb near the high altar, but in 1636 to 7, the chapel was extended eastwards about 28 feet, and Keyes' monument was moved to a niche high in the wall in the extension where it remains to this day. So the original location is on the map in red, and the new one is in green. In 1613, this was joined by a small tablet to William Webb, who was nephew to the then master William Branthwaite. Webb was a fellow commoner of the college, and a fellow commoner is a higher or was a higher rank of student who paid additional fees for privileges such as dining at high table. Originally, this monument was on the south wall of the chapel in the red box here, but in 1755 it was moved to the north side to make way for a monument to a later master, Thomas Gooch, which I won't be discussing. The two other monuments that I will be discussing today are to Thomas Legg, Keyes' successor as master here on the right, and Stephen Peirce, a fellow and benefactor here on the left. These were erected in the same decade, the 1610s, and that helps to explain their remarkably similar format. Although Peirce's monument, like Webb's, was a very expensive monument, probably the product of a London or possibly Southwark workshop, whereas Legg's monument was um, probably by a local workshop and it's made from clunch, which is a local stone. As you can see uh, here, the monument to Leg was originally opposite Keyes' monument and in line with the high altar. And we can also tell this because one of these panels um, that you can just see at the bottom of this image comes off the wall, it's on a hinge, and you can see um, the medieval piscina, which was used to wash the instruments of the mass um, still there in the wall. The monument to Perse is on the north side of the chapel, and like Leg, there's no evidence that it has moved, but thanks to this extension in 1637, the, um, both monuments stand much further from the high altar than they did originally. At this time, entry to universities was limited to men, and as Stephanie Knoll has observed, Oxbridge chapels of the 16th and 17th centuries were exclusively male burial grounds, notwithstanding the fact that many heads of houses sometimes took wives who lived within the college. Keyes' statutes ordered celibacy for all members of his new college, and this was unusually well observed in the period, with no married masters until the 1640s. But although no women were buried here, the commemorative atmosphere was not exclusively male. The celebrated benefactor Joyce Franklin, who's here on the left, left, along with money for scholarships, the portraits of herself, her father and mother, Robert and Joan Trapps, who were also benefactors of the college, um, and she wanted them to be set up in the oratories or chapel, and they now hang behind the high table in the college hall. So although the four monuments that I'll be discussing today are all dedicated to celibate male members of the college, they may originally have existed in a much more diverse commemorative atmosphere than today's interior suggests. So let's take each of these monuments in turn. John Keyes was born in Norwich around 1510. He entered Gonville Hall at the surprisingly late age of 19. Um, it was much more common for people to enter around 13 or 14. And here he would have studied le uh, Latin, Greek, logic, rhetoric, and advanced subjects like theology and law. As a student, Keyes had been attracted to theology, but in 1539, he left England to study medicine at the University of Padua. And over the next few years, he completed his doctorate of medicine, traveling around the continent and returning to England around 1544 to five. He settled in London and became an eminent physician to royalty and nobility. And he also became a fellow of the College of Physicians. 
1557, he set about refounding and enlarging Gonville Hall into Gonville and Keys College, and in 1559 was elected master. He served 14 turbulent years as master and had many quarrels with the fellowship. And two issues in particular have interested Keyes' biographers. The first is the question of his religious sympathies, and the second is his exposure to classicism, particularly in architecture, during his travels on the continent. When quarrelling with the fellows of the college, Keyes was accused of both atheism and popery, and he had tried to preserve copes, vestments, albs, tunicles, censers, crosses, tapers, all kind of maths books with all massing abominations, which he apparently called the college treasure. Um, and these were very Catholic objects and they were sort of uh, ceremonially burnt in the center of Gonville Court in December, 1570 during one of his fights with the fellowship. Um, but it's been argued that this actually suggests simple conservatism rather than crypto Catholicism. In the midst of his troubles with the college, Archbishop Parker, who was obviously very Protestant, said of Keyes, there is a difference betwixt the frailty of a man's mutability and the professing of plain impiety. So it may be that his many years, Keyes' many years traveling and making friends of different religious persuasions on the continent gave him a, quite a distaste for the period's theological controversies. The other issue of his exposure to classicism is particularly relevant to a discussion of his tomb, which as we'll see demonstrates an extremely capable grasp of Renaissance classicism by way of Northern mannerism. Keyes clearly had a humanist love of classical iconography and allegory, and he also had access to artisans familiar with the most up-to-date architectural styles. The most significant indication of this is Keyes's allegorical program of three gates, and he devised them himself. At the entrance to the college, this is now in the master's garden, but it was originally your way in. This was the gate of humility, um, a simple uh, pedestal on pedestals, sparse decoration on the pediment, symbolizing the student's entry into your learning. So you know that you know nothing when you first come to the college. Then in the middle of the college, you would pa regularly pass under the gate of virtue, um, which on its other face is dedicated to wisdom. And this is still visible today. It's a tower of the orders. So it's a very correct use of classicism. We've got scholarly ionic pilasters on the bottom story and then Corinthian above. And that was completed around 1565 to seven. And then the final gate in the program was the gate of honor which was finished after Keyes' death. And that still stands in the South range of Keyes Court. And you're only supposed to go through that when you graduate, which is a tradition that is maintained today. So this is a very elaborate three-story scheme, um, surprisingly small. It's completely dwarfed by the Gate of Virtue, um, which is in the same court, um, which is probably, probably meant to be the case. That's probably a message about what's more important. Um, but it's... Uh, it's inspired by Serlio's very popular Libro Quarto, which was the book on architecture used as a pattern for craftsmen across 16th century Europe. Uh, and all three gates are heavily influenced, in fact, by Renaissance architecture. Um, but not just classical architecture, but also classical rhetoric. There's a progressively elaborate um, form to each of these gates. You start with the simple gate of humility and you end up at the very festive gate of honor. And that fits with classical rhetorical ideas about fittingness, the principle that stylistic choices should suit the subject matter and the occasion. These classical influences are also visible in Keyes' tomb. So this is a standing monument of painted and gilded alabaster, and that's an exceptional material for a Cambridge tomb of, the, tomb of this date, so it's very expensive. There's a gadroon sarcophagus, that's um, gadrooning these kind of grooves here on the on the sides. And it lies under a canopy supported by three Corinthian columns. They're the sort of festive kind of column. Um, at the front, there are two half columns behind at the back, which you can just about see. And these strap work designs on the pedestals um, here at the bottom and also at the top are unique on each face. So again, very expensive, well-made tomb. Between the pedestals at the bottom, we have uh, inscriptions with Keyes' age when he died, 63, and his date of death, the 29th of July, 1573. And on the wall behind the tomb chest, there are three recesses. 
The central circle contains Keyes' achievement of arms, his heraldry, and on either side we have swags of carved fruit and flowers suspended from rings. And these motifs all have scholarly credentials. So on the left, we've got a squash or a gourd that's associated with Saint Jerome, who was a scholar saint. And on the right, we've got what looks like a pine cone, probably a, a, an allusion to classical wisdom. Um, the very famous pine cone, ancient Roman pine cone in, in the Vatican in Rome, um, probably something Keyes himself saw on his travels. Uh, but also a pomegranate, which is found on many Oxford College monuments, symbolising the college's collective identity made up of many individual members. So the pomegranate is a sort of metaphor for the college community. Connecting these roundels are two panels with the inscription Fui Chaos, I was Keys, um, that translates as, and the interlaces above and below are um, sangrene or house leek and flower gentle or amaranth. And these appear on Keyes' arms, where it's said that they betoken immortality that shall never fade. So that's quite appropriate for a tomb. There are further classical credentials going on here as well. There's a coffered ceiling under this very ornate canopy, which resembles a design in Serlio. And on the architrave, we have a further um, inscription, which stretches around all three visible sides, which says, Vivit post funera virtus. Um, virtue lives on after the burial. Above this, a pedimented attic with urns, funeral connotations, and on top of this pedestal, a carved book, and on top of that, um, a carved skull. We know that Keyes had a big say in the position and design of his tomb. The college annals tell us that in June 1573, he came to Cambridge one last time, knowing he was dying, to resign the mastership and plan out his tomb in the chapel. And the annals also tell us that Keyes gave the inscriptions on his tomb to his executors himself while he was alive. This wasn't the first tomb that Keyes patronised. In the same year that he refounded founded and Keyes, he also organised the creation of a new tomb for a man called Thomas Lineker in St Paul's Cathedral. And Lineker was a humanist scholar, um, a former president of the College of Physicians, so one of uh, Keyes' sort of ancestors in that role. And although the tomb uh, to Lineker was destroyed in the Great Fire of London, its epitaph is recorded in um, various histories of St Paul's, and that was Vivit Post Funera Virtus. So Keyes didn't invent this epitaph himself. It was attributed to the second Emperor Tiberius. Um, it enjoyed a widespread revival in the early 16th century because it was quoted by a man called Georg Sabinus but it had already appeared on several monuments in the first half of the 16th century before Keyes started to use it on Lineker's tomb. But obviously he liked it so much and he, he not only used it for Lineker's tomb, he also had it as his own epitaph. But as we'll see, he plays around with it. There are two named uh, candidates for the design of Keyes' tomb. Um, uh, there's a list called the several charges of the tomb which records money paid for carving to a man called Theodore. And this is probably Theodore Herveus, who was a German architect and craftsman um, who also appears in the college annals when he set up a 60 dial sundial in Keyes Court in 1576. So he was obviously an intellectual making sundials was a very complicated mathematical process. And his very striking portrait with a polyhedron is in the college collection um, to this day. However, um, Paul Binsky, the medieval historian, has suggested another architect with classical credentials was also working in college at this time, and that was Humphrey Lovell, who was the Queen's master mason. There's a letter of 1569 from one of the college fellows to John Keyes, um, telling him how work is progressing on the gate of virtue, and this refers to a master builder called Humphrey. And the gate itself bears quite a strong resemblance to the uh, now destroyed gateway of um, the old Somerset House in London, which Lovell completed around 1547. So uh, Theodore Herbeus was probably involved in Keyes' tomb as the carver, but whether he designed it himself or followed designs drawn up by Lovell or somebody else is unclear. I personally think Keyes may have had a design in the tomb as well. Besides its classical visual impact, the inscriptions and the arrangement of them particularly demonstrate quite a witty intellectualism. So the inscription Fui Chaos, I was Keys, gives a voice to the tomb or perhaps the corpse underneath. 
And this can be read as a form of prosopopeia, which is a, the name for personification in classical rhetoric, a very well-known literary technique in this period, um, which is designed to sort of persuade by making dead men or inanimate objects seem to speak. So um, although this inscription, Fui Caius, I was Keys, emphatically states Keys's pastness, I was, the speech seems to take place in the moment of reading, which creates a kind of tension between tenses. And by giving his corpse speech, Keyes lends weight to the other inscription on the monument, Vivit Post Funera Virtus, Virtue Lives On After the Burial, because it actualizes this continuation of life or reputation post funera. So it's sort of um, playing with what, what the other inscription says. Some commentators have seen the sentiments of this second inscription as surprisingly secular, emphasizing virtue's immortality and not the soul's. But the spatial arrangement in the chapel actually offers an alternative view. When you enter the chapel, you can only see the word vivit on the side of the monument facing west. There it is. Now it's very high up, but when it was originally made, it would have been almost at eye level. Initially appearing without its subject, which turns out eventually to be uh, virtuous or virtue, vivit can be read as the third person he lives. Then as you move around the monument, you, say, you see post funera and the sentence becomes, he lives after burial. And it's only when you reach the altar side and you turn round, you discover that it's virtue that lives on after the burial. So it's very playful. There's a spatial arrangement which animates the inscription, creating multiple layers of meaning and possibly suggesting Keyes' influence on the design of the monument itself, not just its location and the inscriptions. The next monument set up in the chapel also made use of witty intellectual wordplay, and that's the monument dedicated to William Webb, the student who died in college at the age of, age of 17. It's a very unassuming wall tablet of slate and alabaster, but it was expensive, probably made in a London, uh, City of London or Southwark workshop. Webb originally uh, was commemorated in two places in the chapel. There was a simple slab over his grave on the floor, and there was a wall memorial, this wall memorial, which was originally on the south wall, uh, as I said, and is now on the north. The epitaph tells us he was from Mockcombe in Dorset, and he was the nephew of the then master William Branthwaite. And it says that he died piously and peacefully, having completed four years here and at Oxford with the highest distinction. For a monument to a young student, the memorial is surprisingly original and prominent. The tablet shows the achievement of arms of Webb and several other coats of arms and is infused with humanist punning on the name Webb. So, for example, the Latin inscription, which can be translated as death revolving his darts, twisted them into that web, but the web lives on thanks to the dart. Um, so it's punning on his name and these puns continue in the English trans uh, inscription, which refers to the web of faith that ties Christ to the soul. Beneath this strap work at the bottom, uh, there's a tasseled string carved in low relief, um, which appears to go through a hole in the central um, panel and come out again on the other side. This is a standardized motif, but it gains um, potency from the puns on threads and webs in the epitaph. Webb's tablet is very different from the imposing monuments around it but it shares the same scholarly mood with Latin puns on webs, but also piety. The proliferation of heraldry introduces a note of blood relations into the college chapel, which is a space more usually concerned with intellectual heritage. The prolific use of quarterings points to webs and thus also his uncle, the master's relationship to wider armigerous or um, sort of gentry society. It reflects the monument's role in perpetuating the memory of the subject which is a role it shared with the traditional classical funeral oration. In the Renaissance, funeral sermons often stressed the gifts of the next life over worldly achievements, but the classical oration was much more secular in tone, celebrating aspects of identity such as a good birth. Webb's monument combines aspects of both pious funeral sermons, so the epitaph's description of his pious and peaceful death, and also the more secular funeral oration. Thomas Legg 
was Keyes' successor as master. And although he died in 1607, financial difficulties meant the college didn't quite manage to get round to building his planned memorial until about 1619. His monument protrudes approximately two and a half feet from the south wall. It's probably the work of a local workshop made of the locally quarried stone called Clunch. A pair of freestanding Corinthian columns and two half columns support an entablature with the inscription Col Legame della Lege, that's in Italian, and it means with the chain of the law. And that's a pun on his profession, he was a legal scholar, but it's perhaps also um, a pun on his relationship to other members of the college, he's their colleague or collega. Above this, we've got two obelisks, quite a standard funerary motif in this period, and also a simple um, shield of arms. And underneath this full length kneeling effigy shown at a prayer desk. How closely effigies actually resembled their subjects in this period seems to vary on a case by case basis. But in Legg's case, the effigy's drawn face, long nose and somewhat sunken hooded eyes do resemble his portrait, which now sits in the college hall. So that suggests that maybe this or possibly another portrait may have been used as a model. The panel beneath the effigy shows two hands clasping a flaming heart and inscriptions noting Legg's identity, age and date of death. And underneath there on the sort of slanting um, shelf, there's a Latin inscription which can be translated as love joined them living and so may the same earth link them in their tombs, Gostlin's heart you still have with you, O Legg. And then underneath again, another uh, inscription, Moriendo vivit, in dying he lives. So the Gostlin mentioned with such passion on the monument is John, uh, John Gostlin, who became master in 1619 when the funds for commemorating Leg finally matured. This motif of the flaming heart and the very suggestive inscription is sometimes taken as a coded reference to homosexuality. However, the wording and symbolism is conventionally platonic. The reference to being joined in life might suggest that Leg was Gostlin's tutor, as it was the practice for tutors to share rooms and even beds with their students in Oxford and Cambridge right until the late 17th century. Ultimately, the difficulty of mapping contemporary ideas about sexuality, the sort of illegibility of that kind of thing to us now, means that this conventional description isn't evidence for or against a romantic or sexual relationship between the two men, but they were clearly very close. Pass was another Kean of Norwich origins. There he is. He entered college in 16, uh, sorry, 1565 at the age of 17, and he became a fellow. He was bursted for several years, and he amassed a large fortune through his medical practice, which on his death he left to the college and to good causes in the town. He founded the Purse School. In college, he bequeathed the money for new buildings, six new fellowships, and six scholarships. And his memorial is slightly shallower, probably because it's halfway down the chapel, it protrudes about a foot from the north wall. There are two freestanding Corinthian columns on pedestals, flanking a Renaissance arch and a heavy entablature with, again, the, the two um, obelisks, very common, and his achievement of arms. And under the canopy, like the leg monument, a full-length effigy, um, he's wearing a ruff and academic robes, and he's kneeling on a cushion in front of a prayer desk with an open book. As in Purse's will, patterns of six are found throughout this monument. So he founded six scholarships, six fellowships. There are six rosettes under the uh, soffit of the entablature, and there are six again under this part of the monument as well. The extensive inscriptions here at the bottom set out in Latin and in um, period translations into English, uh, his charitable deeds and achievements, and they are written in the first person. They again were probably written by Purse himself. This use of full length um, figures to represent scholars or members of the middling sort in this period, even wealthy ones with their own coats of arms, that's highly unusual. Most monuments to schoolmen are half length busts facing front on as if they're standing behind a lectern and, a lectern and teaching in perpetuity. And there are numerous examples of that type found in the college chapels of Oxford and there are a few in Cambridge as well, including Thomas Playfair's monument, which is in St. Botolph's Church in Cambridge, just down the road from Keys, um, which I'm showing you here on the right. Um, 
Pebsner describes this as an absurdly bad example of the type, which I think has been mean. In contrast, the only local contemporary monument to even approach the ambition of those in Keyes Chapel is that of the Middle Temple lawyer William Beck in St Edmund King and Martyr, which is just on the other side of the marketplace from Keyes, and that's here in the middle. And like leg and purse, Beck is shown as a full length effigy in rough and robes, his hands are missing um, now, but obviously weren't at the time. And the connection with the Keys monuments isn't a superficial one. Beck was also a Keyan. He entered the college in April, 1577 with Purse as his tutor. And Beck's second wife, Catherine, was Purse's sister. And along with Catherine, uh, Purse was Beck's executor. So they're really closely related. Um, it's possible that Purse even had a hand in Beck's monument, probably likely um, elaborating on this same or similar format when it came to designing his own. At least that's one possibility. Maybe we are seeing here an example of hidden female patronage, Catherine perhaps having an influence on one or both monuments, one to her husband, the other to her brother. Um, this one to her brother was probably set up by her second husband, who was also a distant relative of hers and Purse's and um, he was also Purse's executor. So it's all very sort of interlinked. Admittedly, the idea that Catherine had something to do with this is probably less likely. Um, in the annals, it's mentioned that Catherine signed an agreement with her mark, which suggests she was incapable of signing her own name. But scholars of this period have noted that an inability to sign your name with a pen, which is a very specialized skill of dexterity, wouldn't necessarily mean that she was illiterate or unlearned or even um, that she wasn't capable of writing with other materials. So um, I leave that there as a possibility. So what were the motivations for these monuments? Well, writers at the time make frequent mention of the inspiring good influence that monuments and portraits could have on molding the character and habits of viewers over time. So Thomas More in Utopia um, mentions how the inhabitants of his ideal state set up in the marketplace the images of notable men and of such as have been great and bountiful benefactors to the Commonwealth for ye perpetual memory of their good acts and also that the glory and renown of the ancestors may stir and provoke their posterity to, for, to virtue. So we might think of Purse there as a bountiful benefactor to the college. But also we have um, Lawrence Humphrey in The Nobles are of Nobility um, saying that children might gaze on the images and titles of their ancestors and not only read their virtues, but learn to counterfeit them. Um, he's talking about monuments again being set up to worthy men in ancient times. Now, obviously, he's talking about um, hereditary uh, relationships, um, actual family relationships. And as Stephanie Knoll and others have pointed out, the, cha the college chapel is much more about intellectual, not filial ancestry. But the principle holds. Um, and the fact that these monuments are designed to, in a sense, um, perpetuate the memory and the presence of the deceased among the living members of the community is very in keeping with rhetorical principles that eyewitnessing, feeling like you're really present or someone else is really present, um, is the most powerful way of persuading you uh, to follow their example, for example. Keyes' statutes for the refounded college stipulate that the fellows and scholars shall at the accustomed time of prayer in the chapel every day at 5 a.m. be on their knees in their stools or seats, the fellows in the higher, facing the east end on their knees. Not something uh, that we have to do now. Um, but the effigies of leg and purse kneeling at prayer desks facing east follow this regulation in perpetuity visualizing the cohesion of the new community in line with Keyes' refounded statutes. In the early decades of this refoundation, the effect of continuing presence in the chapel must have been extremely powerful. Meanwhile, the speaking epitaph of Keyes' monument also contrib contributes to an ongoing sense of presence. Sometimes the Reformation is seen as having a negative impact on the production of funeral monuments, particularly due to their visual component. There was anxiety about what was acceptable um, as imagery in religious spaces. But there's also a sense in which the Reformation galvanized the desire for commemoration. As many historians have noted, in the decades after the abolition of purgatory, the dead were no longer part of the community in the same way that they had been. They no longer needed the prayers of the living. 
So regular remembrance of the dead through prayers for their souls was no longer an acceptable part of society and people had to find other ways of maintaining their connection um, with the dead. Although I should say that Keyes' statutes actually ask um, members of the college to pray for his soul, which is a bit suspicious if you're thinking he's a Catholic. So um, he's trying to perpetuate that. But as I hope I've shown, the uh, visual and sculptural formats of these Keyes monuments demonstrate a desire to secure the memory and the presence of their subjects in the minds of the college community, representing them in perpetuity to their intellectual rather than filial descendants. Thank you.